you know, the, so here's, let me just kind of tell you um, where we, what, what we've been doing, and then I'll just throw you into this. So Jason and I have been talking about the fact that, and he's been kind of bringing me up to speed. Jason has been, um, some 20 years ago, he dropped inside of a library and never came out because he was trying to figure out what Christianity was. He comes out of the library, <laughs> and opens up the front door and realizes that nobody out here now knows what Christianity is either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah um, that's right. Yeah, and that's so right. <laughs> and, and that's been interesting. And so for me, I am I'm probably have a survival of the carcass that is from what Christianity used to be. And so I'm remember I can look from that yeah. that fragmented um, or that that piece of carcass and say, wait, muscles have to go here and not there. <laughs> Skin had to shape around the yeah, this way. Yeah. And so I'm picking up on it too. We talked about this. Uh, time when we were when i was in um uh, with you guys and we were in the car talking about you know southern baptist convention yeah um and we all see that something's yeah, broken yeah. but what we've been doing is we've realized that we've been in conversation with guys from yesteryear and because of the breakdown of covenant succession covenant faithfulness we don't know that we're in conversation mm -hmm. with these same people so we're in conversation with marks right yeah. now we've been in we out of conversation with Dante and yeah. in conversation with Machiavelli, right? <laughs> and so we're having this conversation <laughs> and Christians are just now yeah. realizing that how big this conversation, I don't even think they realize how big this conversation is or that they're even in conversation yeah. with people so much so that when they go to fight critical race theory, they end up fighting it with critical race theory because they're saturated in a broken yeah, metaphysics, right. right? Yeah, that's right. And that's so right. what we've yeah. been doing is just kind of trying to, for my sake, mainly, <laughs> this is all for me, um, <laughs> is, tr is, is trying to point out, you know, who we're in conversations with when we're talking about certain things and working our way back mm -hmm. to the real conversation that we need to be having in the way the world is really made all the way back from Genesis, you know, to, to now mm -hmm. and understanding um, how to have the right conversations so that we can fight well and, um, most yeah. of it right now is that we're fighting just with the enemy's tools. And so we can't get any ground in that way. And so, yeah, that's um, right. we, yeah. what was the last one, Jason Dante? I think we just finished. Freud, well, Freud, we did yeah. Freud last, what, you know, that we, the people <laughs> don't realize that most of their assumptions about their own psychological makeup actually come from Freud or are a response to Freud in some way. But that there's a different way yeah. to think about selfhood and think about um, your your mm -hmm. own. Um, you, know, you don't have to just be an ego bouncing between your super yeah, ego right. and your id. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so uh, we have a list of people. And when Kant came up, I was like, man, I don't know how we do this without bringing in the good doctor to come. <laughs> <laughs> you know, had this conversation. So I don't even know really where to start with Kant. I'm kind of, um, I, mm -hmm. I don't know anything really about Kant. Uh, the first time I heard, I was telling Jason, the yeah. first time that I heard of Kant was when I was sitting in the car talking to you, filming for the doc by what standard. And you're saying, um, the problem is that we function as like Kantian man. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what, huh? Did he yeah. just curse these guys out? Or is he talking <laughs> about a person? What is going on here? <laughs> like, yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I kind of need to start at the beginning here. Who is Kant and why is he important right now? Wow. Um, and this is when I always need to grab my sidekick historian, uh, Gl Dr. Glenn Sunshine, because he always knows those details of the person's life. I know their ideas. <laughs> he knows all the specifics. But Kant was a, 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 a very significant, if not one of the, well, probably one of the most significant um, Enlightenment philosophers. Um, what do we mean by enlightenment? Well, um, figures of kind of the radical term in Western thought away from any kind of semblance of a Christian vision to really putting the Christian um, vision within a larger container. That would be the enlightenment vision. Um, and enlightenment vision is kind of a, a grand vision in the sense that it wants to replace the grand vision of Christianity, um, but rather than have its unity in Christ and, and the infinite God who's the source of all things, it has a very generic place of trying to unify things. Um, mm. 
usually in in some kind of common notion of human rationality or common notion of human experience um so so i mean that's one of the i think key moves of the enlightenment but it was a radical revising exercise so it took all of those things christianity had interpreted from its vision and reinterprets them from this new new center and ground so you have the rationalist tradition the rationalist would ground um, all understanding that is of of meaningful significance within the human's rational consciousness, <laughs> um, and or it would be the kind of the other side would be the the empiricists, which ground it in our sense perception that we filter through our rational consciousness. So either way, the human being becomes sort of the interpretive ground and center of of reality, um, and then everything is brought under that lens and brought into that interpretation. Uh, that's probably the kind no, that, of the thinnest definition I could. No, that's really good. Mm-hmm. And actually, Jason was helping me work this out too because we did one on um, what was it in conversation with um, which one was it, Jason? I forget which one it was. Now we were talking about the Enlightenment. Um, yeah, and. Um, I can't. It, I'm going to mess this it, up, but it it was the the short history of the Enlightenment that ended up taking what two and a half hours or something, three hours. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but one of the things that was really helpful was yeah. understanding it through consubstantiation and transubstantiation, and understanding it through the idea of who has the authority. Right. Ultimately, um, is the authority something that mm-hmm. is um, in the person? Or is it given to the person from a transcendent, right? <laughs> um, who's ultimately in, yeah. in the authority position, and and so helping helping me through that, it was really helpful with, with as far as enlightenment goes. And so it sounds like Kant's going to really come in here and go towards the rationalism side. Am I right about that? He is, and and one thing to keep in mind, and this is very hard for us, and and I, I don't want to tr- trace this now. But at some point, I, I would like to get back to it. Even our very notion of authority and divine authority has changed. Um, the modern world basically sees the, the divine authority as extrinsic to us, as like the imposition of a will on us, rather than the, the law that governs our whole created being, and which is that in which when we conform to it, we actually flourish and are free, right? So the law... Is, a, is an authority from the outside in the Enlightenment that basically comes to, to force us to conform. Whereas a classic Christian vision, the law is, is something that comes from the Creator, but because the Creator is not, not a bigger being that comes down and enforces His will, but is actually the will that brings us into being, therefore the law is, is something that is fundamental to us as human beings and our nature. To conform to the law is actually to enact truthfully what it means to be a creature, yeah. <laughs> right? So the Enlightenment completely distorts that, um, and and so it turns the law into something over against us as creatures, as if we only have a, a, a nature and a freedom and an agency if we can push off that that law of God, right? Push it out so that I have a space in order to enact the law of my own being, right? That's, uh, so we'll get back to that. But the whole point is, is that even the very notion of authority and inside outside get revamped with the enlightenment. And it is so infiltrated our way of thinking of things that it takes a lot of weaning to get off of it. Mm-hmm. And then to put on, I think the, the rich Christian vision um, so we'll, you know, maybe back back to just Kant. Kant well, sort of I, comes and wraps I, up. Can I just add something in really quick? One of the things that's really interesting yeah. is reading the the missionaries and then the poets that received the missionaries in Gaul yeah. and and then the Angles and the Saxons. <laughs> and so this is um, Pope Gregory, uh, um, Charlemagne. Uh, Alfred the Great, that era, so six, seven, eight hundreds, for them, they bring the law as if it's good news, the law of God, because they say it has a it yes. has a lifting effect. The law lifts yes. you out yes. of the animosity that you have with creation, the animosity that you have with one another, yes. the animosities between the tribes, right? The yeah. by the law removes the rivalry 
and lifts you up into a full human existence. And so it's amazing. Char- we yes, we, we yes. look at Charlemagne and we say, oh, he converted at the end of a sword. But what's amazing, that's not what they say, right? We act as if Charlemagne yeah, yeah. was a greater oppressor. He was stronger and then he enforced the law of God on them. What they say is he came and rescued us from our uh, and from the animosity that we had with one another, from the perpetual warfare, from the animosity that we had with Four, yeah. the creator, as well as the animosity we had with the creation. Right. He rescued us from fate by bringing us the law of God. That That's what they actually say. So within 100 years, they're writing yeah. hymns in praise of Charlemagne. And we and yeah. we look at him, we look at Charlemagne as if he was some sort of oppressor. Right. He comes in. He yeah. saves them all. They tried to, they, I mean, he they, he goes to war with them because they were enemies. He yeah. conquers them and then gives them schools and gives them churches and gives them freedom. I mean, in their mind, yeah. he gave them freedom that they had never had before by bringing them the, yeah. uh, the, the law in such a way that now they could expect what was, they, they knew what to expect next week next next month next year and they were freed from the fate that they were held by yeah. before so it's and th- and this is all in the the poetry of the gauls and the anglo-saxons i mean they they sing the praises of the law and the law bringers like charlemagne and alfred in yeah. i mean alfred the great is called the great because he brought the law of god to them and we, uh, because it the law freed them from fate um so it, it's it's a whole different view of authority but it's a really a whole different view yeah. of our humanity what what we are um yes. we're not we're not pure will we are um That's creatures right. that come to yeah. bring uh the to 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 be lifted up into the authority that god has established in order to beautify the world yeah. with our authority yeah so, so yeah. Kant somehow changes yeah, and, that, and, though. And, and, yeah, or he, he, I think he brings to a culmination a lot of changes. Um, so, and I think this is why he's such a pivotal figure. He, he brings to, in, in some sense, he sums up a long process. And I, I think we talked, it was a couple of years ago, as you mentioned, we talked something about that process. Then that when innovations happened, especially in, in, in the West, but not simply from the West, this came out of Islam, the, uh, in particular from Islamic philosophers, Avicenna, Averroes. These figures um, really brought, brought a different conception of God into conversation and, and a different interpretation of philosophy's relation to theology into, into Christian spheres, and Christians began began to run with it. Um, and what eventually ends up happening as we, well, there's a, there's a lot of big things that happen and there are things you can't ignore to make sense of Kant. And so maybe I could just spell a couple yeah, of them, ahead. not too much detail. And then, then kind of, so I think one way I talked about it before is when, when classic Christians understood God, they wrestled with the language to, to be able to articulate the fullness of God's being. So they would borrow from different philosophers, you know, um, in order to to carve out a language to discuss those aspects of biblical truth in ways that really drew out the deep metaphysic and or or what we call ontology, the very being of God in its fullest sense. And so they would they would they really hammered out a language um, that helped them articulate those biblical truths as they entered into places the Bible doesn't directly address, but indirectly address. Let me give you an example. When, the, the, when theologians of the church fought heresies, the Christological heresies, those heresies that had to do with the two natures of Christ, um, that what was going on there is a fight not over the Bible, because all the groups were referring to the Bible. Um, it wasn't merely over privileged interpretation of the Bible, because all of them had some different emphasis, the Antiochian school, the Alexandrians. It was a question of what is the proper or implicit biblical view of reality that makes the interpretation of Christ the fullest of what scripture expresses. 
In other words, when scripture talks of Christ as the eternal word and, and the eternal word become flesh, how do we talk about that word and that flesh in such a way that when we, we are referencing it, we're being faithful to the implicit view of reality the Bible is, is assuming when it talks about Christ? Um, so what that means is the Arians, according to Orthodox Christianity, had that metaphysic, that view of reality, and that ontology, that view of being wrong. And they were crunching Jesus up into a, a therefore, a wrong metaphysic that was at odds with the full biblical picture. So it wasn't this fight. I can't stand this conversation that goes on. It's been going on for centuries in theology, and now it's all over the evangelical world. This fight between the Hellenic perversion of the gospel versus the gospel. Those people have no clue of what's going on <laughs> theologically when the church borrows and re-patterns ancient philosophy. First of all, all truth is God's truth, so any truth that philosophers had belongs to God first. Christians are just going to take it back, right? <laughs> um, and, and then they're weaning it off the false gods, purifying it to serve the true God. So those categories, language, concepts, they, they, they're for Christian use. They are not to become... The, 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 the terms that scripture is supposed to submit to, rather they serve the scriptures in helping it unpack its deeper implications, okay? So the, when we came up to our doctrinal teachings in, in, say, the Council of Nicaea or Chalcedon, what the church was doing was articulating that rich web of reality that helped present properly the true nature of God, the true nature of humanity in union in Christ, right? So what we begin to get is a radical and for the first time ever in world history, the inbreaking of a new vocabulary, if you will, um, Christianese, if you want to call it that, a way in which you can start to communicate and talk about God with a proper grammar that allows you to pull out that metaphysic that is implicit in the biblical content. And so you start to get the church talking about the proper way to understand divinity in a Christian way, the proper way to understand creatureliness and humanity in a different and distinct way, and the proper way to talk about their union uniquely in Christ, and then our union with Christ and divinity in light of his work. So we were given insight into an understanding of God and creation that was fundamentally different than the pagan world could ever conceive, and no other philosophy or worldview has the capacity to, to conceive either. The closest are, of course, the other Abrahamic faiths, because we do share some things from the doctrines of creation. Right. But other than that, other than that, and again, we, we do have certain things we can communicate with 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 pagans and, and all religions and cultures just because there is an echo of creation that reverberates in them. But they they are stuck in idolatry and they need to be weaned from it. Um, so 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 what happens there is we we the church carved out a comprehensive or started to work through these implications with these different theological conversations and debates. The best way to read those classic Christian debates, even like of Anselm or an Aquinas or an Augustine, is read them along with their commentaries. You'll begin to see why they're addressing what they're addressing biblically. If you don't, you'll think they're just talking about philosophical discussions. Mm. But when you actually see the exegetical grounding of what they're up to, you begin to realize, wait a minute, something deeper is going on. And this is why, of course, with the Reformation, there's a return to commentary in common places because it, it wants to pull the church back to that center. Um, can, so anyway, I, I'm chasing I, things now. So what Can is, I just add something yeah. real quick? Mm -hmm. So the Jason, you Cal just pulled back a little bit off you. Yeah. Cal Calvin... Uh, yeah, there we go. Said, when when Calvin is asked what his uh, he, somebody mentions to him as he's an older man, uh, you know the institutes are your great work, and he says no 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 my commentaries are my great work. Yeah, right. He says that's what I want to be remembered yeah, yeah. for. Um, but the yeah. the we, but you mentioned commonplaces. I don't think most people are going to know 
uh, what commonplaces are. Um, and co- so yeah. that commonplaces are the the commentary on particular passages that where people pause in their sermon series through a book and say, now that we're here at this passage, say Romans 13, we're going to expound on the doctrine of the uh, of the civil magistrate, because this is the common place that yeah. people go to to discuss the civil magistrate. And so they'll they and then they would collect those common places into um a, a book of the common places that that sort of yeah. develops what becomes systematic theology, a way mm. of going through systematically all the different uh, play, uh, all of the different major topics of theology. And then systematic theology develops also dogmatic theology alongside it that says, here's the, um, mm-hmm. here's a s- systematic understanding of the doctrines of the, the church and the ways they interact with one another, right? So systematic theology and dogmatic theology develop out of this practice of commonplaces um, the, where you pause right. to, in your sermon series, you pause to talk about <laughs> a major theological issue that usually is derived from this particular text. Mm. So that, um, so we, we, yeah. we have a tendency now to, uh, put systematic theology as the major thing, but it actually grew out of preaching and commentary commentaries, which mm-hmm. were considered the major thing, but they collected in such they collected in the, into commonplaces uh, for usefulness. So there's a good idea, um, but it was derivative yeah. of uh, in a way that we yeah. don't um, think of it anymore, or do it, or do it. No, yeah, unfortunately, no, don't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, I think with the Reformation, they wanted to make clearer um, those aspects that were the kind of foundational exegetical ground. And then, um, then like, you know, Calvin's Institutes, um, the summary of those yeah. commonplaces. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but, and I think a lot of the early church, just, they just ran them together because they didn't work with the same issues that Calvin was having right. to deal with. I mean, they took for granted they took for granted that we were in a Christian environment in which, uh, for example, our, our reason was always going to be functioning not autonomously, but always governed within the created order, given the intelligibility given to it by the creator. So there wasn't this tension between using, for example, a non-biblical source in interpreting the scripture because they weren't at odds. They understood reason, first of all, is creaturely. Mm. <laughs> it's a creature. Mm. It has its 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 um its grounding in the gift of the the intelligibility of the creator, and it aims for truth as it does. And so you'll see them use these these interchangeably. What I like to say is one of the things you'll notice about the classical world, it is not the result of a Christianity plus paganism wed together faith and reason somehow, you know, harmonize where there is no, 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 um, you know, where they're both on the same ground. That's really a false picture of what's going on there. You can read any of the patristics and you'll see they don't agree with that. You can read Aquinas, who they blame for all that. It's nowhere to be found (laughs) there. (laughs) Um, Nowhere. Um, This actually develops later in some what we call neo-Thomist thinking, uh, thinkers that are part of the groundwork for the modern world. They're breaks from classic Christianity um, and they're perverted interpretations. Um, But anyway, that's 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 another show. Um, So so one of the things that's important here, though, is let me let me sum it up in the briefest way what we were given. One is a conception of God that can go basically like this. God is that infinite plenitude of being, right? From everlasting to everlasting. Um, and because, because of that, or, or another way to put it is, because God is the self-existent one, we've given the naming of God in Exodus, I am, the self-existent one, as theologians begin to flesh out what the Bible teaches. This means God's, God's nature is God's own existence. That's the way theologians will talk later. What does it mean for God to be God? It means to be that which is the infinite existent one. Infinite sheer existence. I am. I don't need anything else to be. I fully am. I don't need creation to be me. I fully Mm -hmm. am, Mm -hmm. right? God is such that God is fully God, whether God creates or not. 
There is no augmentation to God by creating. God is absolutely self-sufficient and, and happy and perfect whether God creates something or not. That's what Christianity first brought. Why? The pagan gods needed creation in order to be superior. Mm. God is superior in his own nature, out of his own plenitude, because he is the perfect, infinite existence that there is. There isn't a little more that God gets, and God can be more complete. Yeah, um, We can't even imagine in but we're talking about yeah. In, in uh, Hesiod, it says, "Why did why did the gods create mankind? Because they got tired of growing their own food, right? So he cr they create men <laughs> to to farm food for them, and then the men are getting along too well, and so he creates a woman <laughs> to go in and cause problems, right? So it's the but but yeah, the the gods are hungry, and so they're so tired of so they create men to be their slaves, basically." Slave. Well, and that's the pa the pagan world, right? The, the creation, in some sense, is, is needed for some lack in God or to augment God. That's paganism, mm. and you need to you. And, 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 and when when pagans talk about God as the ultimate being, they mean in relation to everything else. Christians didn't mean it that way. They say God is the ultimate being in His very own nature, because He alone is the one who is the source of His own existence. He needs nothing else to be. That's what makes God unique and different. God is the sheer infinite perfection of being from everlasting to everlasting. You're fully God. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the beginning, God creates. God's already there full. Matter As a matter of fact, look at John's gospel. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Communion and, and bliss of uh, the bliss of fellowship already exists prior to the creation. Mm -hmm. So Christianity, first and foremost, um, God, or let's, bat, let's emphasize one thing, because this is going to become key. God, when we talk about God as the source in which, from which all things come, the infinite source of being, I am, these are just, they're interchangeable theological terms. We're, what we're saying is God doesn't have an essence called God plus something called existence, and you put them together and that's God. Mm -hmm. God is existence itself. That's the way we said. That's his nature. What is God? To be. The sheer act of being. I am. God names himself that. What, who are you? I am. Yeah. And right? this this is... <laughs> I know the Hebraic side. <laughs> yeah, well, this is why the law of God can be freedom, because God doesn't give a law in order... Because he needs something from us. Right. He his Us. his law can be sheer gift saying here is a description of my life. Right. And come be like me. Here's the law. W whereas the law of God and so, the laws yeah. that the gods give in paganism yeah. are because they lack something. They need something. Zeus is a hero yeah. because he overthrew the Titans yeah. who made him. And then Zeus yeah. becomes the lawgiver yeah. along with the other mm -hmm. gods. But mm -hmm. then it it may, the the philosophers start to say, well, if he's the hero for throwing them off and finding freedom for himself, that makes that would make us heroic if we threw off the gods because their laws yeah. are a, their way of oppressing us to get from us what they need. So we need to be free from the gods, right? That's a the, because yeah. that that's the way that you move up the great chain of being and the laws are the ways that yeah. you're kept below the gods on the chain of being so to throw off the laws is a way to move yeah. up whereas if god is completely if if the god of the actual creation the creator god is completely self-sufficient and needs nothing from us the law of god is actually an invitation into life because He's not needing anything, right? That's how the law of God can be freedom. And as well, when you mess up the metaphysic, then the law becomes a terror. It becomes a punishment. It becomes enslaving. And, and yeah. so does the whole cre creation at that point, because the creation then becomes a burden rather than a gift. You, you're right. And, I, and I'm going to get that day, uh, uh, chalk. You had a, you were going to say yeah, something? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't want to get ahead of, I don't want to get ahead yet, but it's making me mm -hmm. think, though, if that's the line, you know, then... There is no um, creation-creator divide at all, 
So then uh, the way that Jason was talking about that line is then all I need to do is figure out it's tower of Babel. I just mm-hmm. have to figure out how to topple God to be, cause yeah. I, I am in the same line of being as that God. I just need more power that's, to get to it. That's that line of being or plane, plane of being. Of, yeah, yeah. Those are going to be very important because in, in the classic Christian vision, God because God is the infinite act, in act, really, uh, is the to-be-ness, right? If you, to, to really reference God, probably, so you're almost talking verbally. Again, these are analogous, but but we're talking verbally. God is fully in perfect in, in enacting the perfection of God's being. There's nothing that God has to realize. It's perfectly realized. And so God is what God has. So God, you know, we have goodness if we can share in it. We have this. We have these different attributes. As long as we can particip- participate in them, God is God is um, mm. all that he has. So God is goodness itself. God is reason itself. Mm. God is. God doesn't have reason. God is reason in the ground of all reason. Um, God, uh, God doesn't have love. God is love, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so there isn't any lack in God's love to where God needs something else to fill it. God is, you know, infinitely a- a bliss. So, um, so, so, but, but follow this. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, I was going to, you're getting but, there. I was going to get to those. You said there's three things. You said conception of God was one. The second one. Yeah. And with, yeah. And with that, just remember God, a lot of us like to think of God as basically a super substance, yeah. a thing like other things are things rather than the source of everything. Right. And so we need to because what happens is, like you said, when we think of God as one more thing in the chain of things on the same order of things, but just higher up, um, then all of a sudden you're right. We're we're now dealing with not God, the creator, but a lesser God, a finite, infinite, if you will, because it needs being as well rather than being the source of all being. And then secondly, it's in competition with everything else because it's on the same order of things and it happens to be bigger so it's a threat right mm-hmm. um but so in the classic christian vision god god is completely free whether god creates or not and the fact that god creates as we finally get down to it is not because god needed anything or had to because god's being is so full it is sheerly out of the good pleasure of his will to share which that which otherwise is nothing the communication of that fullness, joy, beauty, goodness that God is. Creation is meant to receive. Think of it this way. God is total giver and creation is total gift. That's the best way to put it. God is total giver. God's getting nothing out of the deal. God is completely giving everything. And creation is total gift. I don't have anything. I completely receive what I am and that I am, not just at the start, but beginning, middle, and end. As Roman says, from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. What it means to be a, cre- a creature then, the second point, is that at every moment, I receive what I am and the fact that I am completely from him. God minus creation is still fully God. Creation minus God is nothing. Right? Be, because <laughs> I mean, because <laughs> God is not a thing. Right? God is right. is he is, right. God is not a thing this, that exists on the same plane of ontological that, existence, right? God is uh, he right. he is no God's the thing. infinite perfection of being that gives things their things exactly yeah <laughs> and keeps them in being. So God doesn't create and then give them self sustaining being because they're not being. They can't sustain themselves. God is the being that is continuously actualizing the creature to be right. Mm-hmm. So right now you, all three of us, are held in being. And sustained in being because God is. Right. God is the isness that actualizes us being right now. And, and if if you took away that isness, there'd be nothing. Right. And and we've talked a lot about Gnosticism over the course of the last uh I don't know, year or however long we've been doing yeah. this. But the central it's the central error of Gnosticism is the embrace that yeah. there's a chain of being of which God is at the top. Yeah. And that that you can yeah. that creatures can move up and down that chain of being because they exist on the same 
plane and have the same kind of existence. And so you can move up and down it, right? This And this is, you know, we'll get to Marx yeah. and we'll get to the different people that enact that um, politically in the civil realm. But mm. Kant is trying to enact it on the um, realm of, on the epistemological realm, right? He's made this metaphysical error yeah. and then tries to develop an epistemology in which we can have, uh, and it's not just Kant because Leibniz yeah. does it before him and Descartes sort of does it a little bit, yeah. but then tries to pull back, right? But they've made this error and then yeah, they try to right. establish yeah. an epistemology in which we can have knowledge yeah. like God's knowledge. Yeah. We can have the same sort of knowledge it, yes. that God has. And you won't call it knowledge yeah. unless it is the, the same sort of knowledge that God has. Nothing else counts as knowledge. Yes. Well, this gets right at the heart then of, the, of kind of the next thing. So, so let's think of it. God is fully God, whether God creates or not. So God minus creation is no bigger nor lesser, no more, no less than, than, than God um, plus creation and vice versa. Creation, though, minus God is nothing. So all that the creation is and will be, what it is and that it is, what it means to be a creature means first and foremost that the most fundamental relation you have is to the infinite source of all things, our creator, the triune God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the most fundamental determination of what it means to be a creature. So there is no creatureliness that can ever be removed or autonomous because it absolutely depends on God for all that it is and will ever be. Right. There is no human that doesn't have a relationship with God. The question is the mode of that relationship, but every one of them has one. The, there is broken, sin, death, hell, and the grave, all that. But that is not uh, undermining the fact that God sustains the created essence in being <laughs> of, of everyone. So God is the, what is the most true thing about what it means to be a creature? That God is giving you what you are and that you are. That's number one. This is what most of the world misses. It thinks it has its own identity, right? Its own, its own kind of, it, it does have these things, but these things are fundamentally governed by that primal relationship, the creator creature. Now, the second point is like you just said, analogy. So on this view, right? God is completely ontologically, the being that God is um, on a, completely different plane than the creation. They are not side by side, one in eternity, one in time, right? Um, the creation is its own creaturely plane, which is from God, sustained through God, and oriented when, when orienting itself the right way to God, mm. right? So God, God is not conditioned by the creation because he doesn't need it. He's fully God with it or without it. But the creation is determined by the creator because it doesn't have a what, or a being apart from the creator. So it's an asymmetrical relation. And so here's the way that Christians talk about the, the way of talking about the relation. All of our talk, therefore, about ourselves and God is analogous. What does analogous mean? Well, what it first means is that it's not what the modern world uses. Similar, like Jason was just saying, univocal is the, is the, is the fancy term. When we say God is good, we're not saying that he's, he's good like chocolate. Knox is good just in a, in a, a supreme way. More goodness. Yeah. <laughs> what we're saying is that, yeah, yeah. what we're saying is that there, whatever similarities, they're marked by an even greater dissimilarity. Mm. So in other words, all creation, because it's God's creation, um, is, has a similarity to God all the way down to the fact that it has being right? But this similarity is marked by a radical dissimilarity. And that's the fact that even though we may be like God, because we're God's creatures, God is not like us, right? right. <laughs> so God is nothing like us, even though we have a semblance, something of our creator in us. So because of that, actually, there's something that, that is held in place, a proper balance where we're not bringing God under the umbrella of our concepts. Rather, it's the reverse. 
when we say God is good, we understand that to be marked by that gulf between God's perfection and our creatureliness. So is it- when we say God is good, we're saying God is goodness itself, whereas if I have any goodness, it's because I participate in that goodness as sheer gift and in a creaturely way. So is right? it safe to say that, whereas, that a, a mm-hmm. model day only runs one way, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, God, and yeah. You, you see this, so the modernist theology what they did or the post enlightenment theology is they, they started to say things like people looked around and they saw fathers and they said, fatherhood is good. God is good. We must have created a giant father in the sky because we needed (laughs) that, right? That, that the direction of analogy was we saw fathers. God was, a, and and God is good. Fathers are good. And so God is a father. And so we began defining God as a father because of the relationship that we saw. Um, and But actually what the Bible says is we were created as fathers because God has always been a father, yeah, right? Father. That yeah. says you were called fathers because yeah. of God, right? Um, and what, That's right. what evangelicals are currently doing is they're saying, um, you see Jesus, you know, Jesus came along and he, he looked around for analogies cause he was a great storyteller and he saw these great analogies and he said, I'm like a son to the father because you guys will understand that. So I'm communicating that to you instead of saying, well, no, Jesus came from being a son to the father. And so he came and said, let me tell you about reality. And he used fathers and sons because that mm-hmm. was an analogy to ultimate reality um right not not because uh he was trying to figure out how to communicate to us right the analogy is embedded we are living analogies mm. to the father to 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 the father son and the spirit but it's but it doesn't work the other direction mm-hmm. that, that's right they they are god they what they, they're what we call kind of perfection language god um when we talk about being truth beauty um, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Th- that language, it, when it's understood in the proper Christian sense, is is first and foremost true of God, and only by creaturely analogy true of anything else. But because we don't have, we don't know the essence of God, we can't know God the way God knows God. Therefore, uh, it is always cloaked in a in a certain mystery. That's why we 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 we're always mindful that we have to. Um, be careful with our concepts, not trying to to turn God yes. into our, our limited conceptual way of referencing. Now, think about it the flip side. What it means is there's actually a ground to our terminology, and the, the, the more our creaturely goodness, truth, and beauty, and terms correspond or open to the transcendent, we bring all things into conformity to Christ, the more they actually refract mm. and 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 express that glory in creation, mm. right? So we do get a deeper antenna of what they mean as they apply apply to God. This is why Paul is so zealous. I want to know nothing but Christ, right? Because by doing that, there, there is that all of the, these terms I'm learning have their have are drawn into their infinite meaning, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm I'm radiating in this glory and, and bliss it's because It's like Jordan Peterson it. recently um, he's starting to understand that finally, right? He's like, yeah. look, man, any conversation <laughs> you have, it is coming right back to this right here because this is reality. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think this this yeah. is the other thing right. well, that, that makes mm-hmm. that makes like family mm-hmm. dinners so powerful, right? You um, w- w- for, <laughs> you know, since before we even had kids, my wife and I have been praying, Lord, make our marriage a better reflection of your uh, of your life, right? Make our marriage a better reflection yeah. of of the gospel. And we've been praying with our kids, Lord, make our family a clearer reflection of of your gospel. Lord, make our life a better sermon to the world of who you are. But then when you bring people into around a table, right? The, you've got this opportunity to eschatologically reflect the future into the present, right? God's life will someday include all of us around a table, right? And he, and he, so then every table has an opportunity to reflect that future into the present, right? To reflect that coming that, so that, and that's what it means. Like it's good news. 
that one day we will all be seated around the marriage supper of the lamb. And every time we sit yeah. down as a family, we're reflecting that either better or worse. But but that's why having people to your table for dinner is an is itself an opportunity to preach the gospel, right? Um, it, it and you you because yeah. we are we are little mirrors, we are little reflections that are bent and broken and cracked, more or less, depending on you know our uh, our mm-hmm. uh, you know moral moral life. You're making me hungry, man. All that talk around the table. No. Okay, so let, let no, me. I, I think. I think. I, I might have dropped the third point, but I got conception of God, and from that flows what it means to mm-hmm. actually be a creature, right? And then the third yeah. point was. Yeah. Was well, the way in which we talk okay, about that a way to, through a analogy. way to communicate through yeah. that? Okay, a form of communication. Is that fair enough? Through to that, and one of. Yeah, and, and the reason that's significant is exactly what I think Jason was saying a little earlier, is when, when the shift happens, um, when God no longer is the infinite plenitude of being, not alongside things the way a creature is alongside, but actually the source from which all things come. And so as, as the gospel, I mean, well, as the book of James puts it, um, that all all perfections come from the father of lights, right? Every perfect gift, right? We owe, and this is why Romans is so serious, right? Um, the creation itself bears witness to the fact that it's a creature. It, it, isn't, it isn't being itself. Therefore, if it is, it requires something for it to be and to be what it is. And so because of that, the invisible aspects of God are present. That's a pr- powerful thing. In other words, God is fully present within the visible invisibly why because he is that the infinite source that is supplying all that it is now it has its own distinct nature gift and being but these are always gifts received never grounds of themselves right um and so that's that's a key thing here so the creation um doesn't uh doesn't in any way whatsoever make up for some lack in god so it can be the theater of his glory, the place at which the full display of all the joy and goodness that God is, is able to radiate. And each thing, each creature, because no creature can fully encompass the plenitude of being and perfection that God is, each thing in some way can refract it when it receives its gift the right way and enacts it the right way, when it lives the creaturely okay, life. I don't want to take too and much so of a side trail. so if you notice, Genesis gives... I don't want to take too much mm-hmm. of a side trail, but man, as you're saying this for me, all I'm thinking of, <laughs> this really does destroy the way we even conceptualize um, the uh, saying abortion is okay. If everything you just said is true, yeah. what you do... To yeah. that individual who is reflecting uh, something beautiful about who God is to the rest of us, yeah. <laughs> like even, uh, yeah. uh, uh, but yeah. even in transgender surgeries, you know, like even in, yeah. you know, slavery, even in yeah. uh, the way we treat the poor. I mean, yeah. all that's all of a sudden, if that's real, yeah. then the culmination of humanity itself is working to display the beauty of the eternal existent yeah. one. And destroying individuals yeah. who are designed to do that has to be the ultimate offense. Yes, yeah. and and it what it's what makes the creation groan and stay where where it is, right? Because what are you doing? Exactly that. Because the it's the full flourishing of the creation as it is is oriented toward the creator, where the creation is perfected, elevated, as Jason said earlier. And in that elevation is enjoying all of mm. that, you know, the divine life, if you will. You're communing. We're brought into the inner sanctum of the Holy Trinity through the mediator yeah. Christ. And in doing that, we have all of, all, of the, the, all of that which belongs to Christ given to us through him. And therefore, we are able, it's called fruit of the Spirit in Scripture, but to, to embody forth that glory in our creaturely relations, even in now before the perfection of of all things so when that is is resisted you're right death is is you know is kind of the the alternative um and this is why you even see lying to the holy spirit right death is the the alternative why because it's that which which uh interrupts the flow 
of life and goodness from the created source. One last point before I forget, yeah. you hit it, both hit it right on the money. As creatures do this, we bring the, the transcendent dimension into the earthly, right? So the, the, we, we bring the perfection of our forms in, as a foretaste into the creation, and that bears fruit. It's called building Christ's, you know, building the, the eternal temple, right? What are we here for? We're building that eternal temple on Christ, the chief cornerstone. Mm. And so this is the way in which our forms, God gave us in Genesis, enacted faithfully, reconciled, renewed in Christ, and brought towards their fulfillment. As we participate in that now, we bring the reality of who we are in Christ into the now, and we permeate the temporal with with that glory, that that light that we're now allowed to share in. Anyway, I said no, a no, lot. No, that's that. good we, stuff. We, we can get and, back. Yeah, to Jason, what were you going to say well, before we move on? Well, I, do, I, I there's there's mm-hmm. something about this that is so that, that looking and seeing how God defines something and then it, like giving it a full bodied embrace that that <laughs> that I, that complete. Well, how would you put it? It it confounds the devil, right? It, there's something about that. It can, and it confounds the world. Like, I think a good example of this is if you have, let's say you've got a young lady in your church that gets pregnant out of wedlock, right? Where it's an unwanted pregnancy in the world's terms, but it's often an, even an unwanted pregnancy in our terms, right? The way we, but unwanted by whom is the question you ask. Right. If you, you, you mm-hmm. say, OK, right, that was sin. It was sin that brought it about whose sin. You know, we, we don't even maybe know yet. It was sin that that brought it about. But that child is not unwanted by God or he wouldn't be here. Right. If God is the sovereign creator over all things, then the thing that the church needs to do in that instance is absolutely move in, surround that young woman and surround that child with aunts and uncles by you know covenantal aunts and uncles that say this baby is yeah. here and we love it. We cannot believe that we get this little blessing in our church so that there is no that there is no no longer a fence that's broken down because a fence was broken down somewhere that in which that somebody that 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 child is that that this young woman is pregnant in the first place a fence was broken down but if everybody locks arms around around that young woman and around that child it doesn't matter what fence is broke was broken down because now the fence is all the aunts and uncles and cousins and you know the 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 covenantal community says ours 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 this is ours she is ours this baby is ours that that is not an unwanted pregnancy anymore this is but but that's because god we sovereign sovereignly we know that that child is made in god's image is here on purpose and even if it you know the, because of the existence and presence of god in his sovereignty in his being that holds all things together even if she's running away from god and ends up pregnant there is no away from god mm-hmm. that's right. right there is no away. right there is no away it, 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 that's, that's so we that's so right. that there is no yeah, away. so that's what it looks like <laughs> to say to to embrace yeah. the creator creature divide in this sort of way in a Trinitarian context, right? In an Islamic context, you yeah. lop off her head, yeah. you stone, you her, stone yeah. her, you throw her away, right? In a Trinitarian context, in which the the yeah. enacting of the law of God the, the, is summed up as love, love one another, right? Yeah. Then then you yeah. you surround that woman and that child with so much affection and protection that there is no way you could ever call that an unwanted pregnancy again. Right. That's the difference. And so there are times when the, when the Christian church um, in its, in, in its desire for righteousness actually misses the mark because they've made a metaphysical error. Um, And so uh, they let, they let, um, they, they let the shame uh, undo righteousness rather than yeah. saying what what because what does paul say to do with if you've got a a member 
that is in shame. It says we cover that, right? The community covers yeah. that shame, right? Yeah. So so that there isn't yeah. there that it, that it's invisible to the world, right? So there was if because there was a shameful yeah. act somewhere, whether it's rape or fornication, wherever there's a mm-hmm. shameful act somewhere. But as a community, we reflect God in such that we cover shame because He mm. came in His I, Son know, to cover yeah. shame. That is, it's funny that you say that. That's what, if we're doing it right, and I'm Jason, I can always tell when Jason gets super excited because he almost <laughs> eats his whole mic and it comes halfway distorted. <laughs> he, he, he just turned into a pastor. There are like, things he just that make me passionate. Yeah, but, but you know what? If we're doing this right, and, and I want to get back to, con- I don't want to lose that at all, but I, I do have yeah. to say this because Jason brought a really good point. If we're doing this right, this is what, like you said, the devil is con- like, he's confused. Confounded confounded the world the world is confounded yeah. by this matter of fact i remember and I'm, this is yeah. very sure but i want to say this i remember when i came front face to face with another person's sin that i thought was absolutely egregious and i remember thinking oh my goodness i'm the guy who is praying Lord, thank you that I'm not like that. I know. <laughs> and yeah. it hit me as a Christian. We never, I grew up knowing the whole time, like you never pray like that. You never act like that. You don't, you don't right. be that guy, right? But we do it so much when yeah. we see sin, instead of seeing Jesus died for that. That is something God forgives. Yeah. That person can be redeemed. What we do is say, ooh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> I don't like, know what to do with that guy. Like, well, go ahead. And, and I think one of the things you see here is that when we get the, the goodness, the good gift of creation right, we understand that sin, depravity all the way down, it impacts the creation. Let's not, let's not minimize right. that. Or, or, but in the triumph over it, in, in, in the gift of redemption and renewal, um, we, we can look even at the fallen, broken world through the triumph of Christ and see the image of That's God right. that is held in being the created essence in, with, and under that fallenness. Mm-hmm. And so we are relating to them. This is why you can love your enemy with God's Come kind on, of love, man. right? Because you're, you're, you're loving them from God's love, which again, remember, God isn't determined or affected by the creation because God is fully complete. And so because of that, the, 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 the problem of sin is for us, <laughs> right? It's not going to throw God, of course. Yes, his perfection it creates judgment. There's no question about it, but that's for us. Um, and that happens to us. So, so the, the, the whole aspect, the whole thing going on here is, is a completely different relationship to it, but because God isn't determined by it, God's love triumphs over it. Right. Why? Because he's not conditioned. He's not limited by our sin. Right. We don't have, right. We don't have to decrease in order for God to increase, and God doesn't need to decrease for us to increase. In redemptive history, that had to happen because there's a time scale. One mission ends, the other's fulfilled, right? But I don't have to cease being an active agent doing this or that in order for God to be active in doing something. Why? Because they're on different orders of being. I'm always receiving passively my being and my endowment from God. But in him, I live and move and have my being, right? Because they're on two different orders of being. And so, and, and so because of that, God doesn't begrudge us our creaturely existence. He, it, it, he's not in competition with it. And so what changes is that very fact. Um, and, and so what basically ends up happening is there becomes, becomes this generic understanding or concept of being that which God and creatures now are inside of. And, and so God is just a being like other beings just happens to be the biggest one around, most powerful, most knowing all of that. And this, this is William Craig's God. No, right, no, no. This, and, and the God of Arius, right. That where Jesus was a shame would have been yeah. ashamed to call us brothers because he's having to move down the chain of being. He's not ashamed to call us brothers yeah. because he's taking on a That's secondary right nature he's not losing anything so what what see this changes with Kant or before Kant so when does this change start well before Before Kant Kant. it really changes it really changes with I mean we 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 label the name uh in philosophy with uh Duns Scotus right remember that good old name Duns (laughs) 
Uh, Dun Scotus. Yeah, well, it's where we get our word dunce, I believe. I may be wrong, but I, I at least heard that before. Well, Dun Scotus was no dunce. He was a brilliant yeah. philosopher, but he he imported and configured some errors that we we are really just having to come to grips with. But he creates what in philosophical worlds we call onto theology. We don't need to worry about that. But that's really the the, the flip side of this shift basically means theism and atheism could be a real possibility in this configuration. Why? Because if God can be within existence, God could also not be within existence. So they're the flip side. So many people have said the real the real core in Western views of God since SCOTUS, which most of our churches hold, most of us hold, I still have stuff I'm weaning off of, is really the atheistic nihilism that is behind it, the no God. And in, in that, that's why athe- modern atheism and modern even Christian theism are two sides of the same coin. One of them is just negated what the other ha- has has used positive you language shut for. Can, you shut um, up. Can, can, I, yeah, can, I, can, I, yeah. can I put Duns Scotus just a, a tad into his <laughs> historical... So Duns, Duns yeah. Scotus... Which just means something like Dunn the Scotsman, I think, if if I remember right. Yeah, yeah that's he, right. He, yeah. he and Aquinas are going head to head. But what happened was the with the um you had a, a couple of things. You had some some uh introduction of Aristotle through Islamic philosophers and Islamic translators, Aristotle had for the most part yeah. been lost to the West, but yeah. um, the, he had been saved uh, through the, the Islamic philosophers and um, especially in North yeah. Africa, the Islamic yeah. people uh, the or the, especially the African I- Islamic folk, they ha- were some of the great, rescuers of manuscripts um the problem was eventually yeah. islam turned would turn on the library over and over and over islam they yeah. would gather up yeah. these libraries yeah. and then they would go burn them right it was it's a tragic story yeah. but you know one of the greatest libraries in the world was in africa um in timbuktu and it was an islamic library and so you Wait, had that's a real place T- it's timbuktu? a real place yeah yeah <laughs> wow. oh man the okay. the, Af- the african the african <laughs> scholars of the seven six seven eight hundreds yeah. nine early nine hundreds some of the most brilliant men in the yep. history of the world right and they were rescuing these manuscripts um as they were especially yeah. great um astronomers right they're uh, the, just brilliant men yeah. great mathematicians and uh these is Aristotle ends up informing a lot of the Islamic philosophy. The great philosophers of the West begin conversations, and you, I mean, really in the 11th century, you have the beginning of this conversation between the Islamic philosophers and the Western philosophers, and you even have universities that are that are trading uh, trading teachers right you've got christian teachers going down to islamic universities islamic teachers coming up to christian universities yeah. and they begin these conversations aquinas is tasked by the pope with um saying please answer these aristotelian islamic philosophers um with a christian yeah. response and he aquinas is brilliant he takes in uh yeah. a, aristotle these Islamic philosophers and begins writing an answer, trying to use their categories. You're trying to pour a Christian understanding into the wineskin of Islamic and Aristotelian philosophy in order to give an answer. And it begins to burst in places. Dun Scotus is one of the Christians that enters the conversation. Um, a little, a little bit late. He's, he is brilliant as well. Um, and but he's mm-hmm. uh, the up till now the categorizations that are being used are all using platonic mm-hmm. uh, pl- platonic vocabulary and they've been putting a Christian metaphysic into this platonic category. Plato, it, th- there are certain platonic dialogues that are also reintroduced at this time that begin messing with the mm-hmm. 
people's understanding of Plato and they realize, oh, dang, the Timaeus actually brings a whole series of ways that we didn't realize Plato was interacting as a pagan. And so their trust in Plato is undermined right at the same time because of these Islamic libraries introducing both Plato and Aristotle. And so you've got a major opportunity, but also a major undermining of some of the understood vocabulary of metaphysics. And so Duns Scotus is a is a 100% strong Christian trying to figure out how do we enter into conversation when um, some of our categories have been undermined and when um, Aquinas is doing a really great job at answering these new um, new well a, a, a really a new enemy a new philosophical enemy um, and they're both trying to answer uh, and they come at it from different angles uh, and some of some of their answers are better than others but that's the historical the historical setting of yeah. this conversation with Dun Scotus um so yeah Mm-hmm. We're gonna have to do one on Dunn Scotus now. <laughs> Dog on you, Jason. Actually, I would blame you, Tom. Yeah. This is your fault. So we, we got this prep world now for Kant to come into, right? So yeah. bring me bring bring Kant into this now. Okay, so I mean, one of the key shifts that happens, I, I would say, in between uh, uh, Aquinas and Scotus, and Scotus runs with, is an emphasis. What happens is because of these debates with Aristotle and people are trying to figure out how to properly proportion reason, the reason of the, the mind of God with the will of God. Um, but with, with Aquinas following the classic Christian tradition, what he basically said was there's nothing arbitrary in the created order. Um, God has stamped it with the eternal logos. And therefore there is an intelligibility to created things that is from God sustained through God and finds its true and fullest sense um, because of God, there's a, there's a reason is porous to the Creator, um, and and so and so there when God wills something, will and intelligibility are the same thing in God really, and they're not one over the other. The 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 other side started to say, whoa whoa wait a minute, that means God is somehow bound by reason. God is locked into reason, right? His will is governed by reason. He can't do anything other than what reason says. So they're already splitting God apart, whereas what what was held together now has been separated. You know, the, the, the and so God's no longer, uh, you know, divine simplicity, if you will, is not understood the same way now. And so what happens with Scotus is will takes on a kind of precedence to reason. So it's kind of you'd call it a, a will governed reason. So when God creates, it's it's there isn't necessarily any rhyme or reason why God created this way rather than another way. God is so free, he's not even bound by his own nature. He is just he's basically can spontaneously, if not arbitrarily, create at whim whatever he wants. But the problem with this is will God the order in creation, Genesis and all the form. What happens if later down the line, God is free to change all that? How do we know there's anything consistently if our reason no longer can reason and say, wait a minute, God did these things because of an inherent intelligibility, which we can know in some sense and know that is in the mind of God. Well, now it's, it, it be- can become viewed as kind of arbitrary, right? God does it, and yeah, must, God must do it for a good re- you know, reason, but reason isn't what governs God. God's will does. And if his will isn't governed by reason, is it a dark thing or a good thing? And so a little later down the line, you get Descartes, who says, we don't know if that which is behind all things is a good or a demonic spirit, right? We don't know because reason can't help us. So, so basically, will starts to define this super being as a superpower, if you will, a ultimate power still within the same order of things. Um, and because of that, it becomes a threatening thing. It was meant to free God and free creation, and it ended up creating a lot more problems because no long reason now was it was something that really followed will. I want you to think real hard about that. Where have you seen this before, right? 
where is the whole postmodern world now? Well, truth is nothing but a mask of a metaphor for power differentials, right? You're, for people will, zone will. So truth isn't some intelligible reality in, in, in governed uh, reality. It's really nothing more the imposition of our will. Well, God is basically a big postmodern in this new view. The arbitrary um, biggest power that has, has basically brought everything in, into being, and in this case, isn't necessarily good. Um, and so this is why you get that old debate. Is it good because God commands it or uh, is it commanded because it's good? Wow. <laughs> right. Jason, um, you got Jason on the edge so, of the seat. Yeah, Jason, what are you? <laughs> right. And, and <laughs> so you, you have, you know, Descartes comes along and, and says that, um, but Descartes still a Christian. So he says, we can't know by our reason, but unless God is that, then we're stuck and therefore God must be must exist right well yeah, what well what 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 you end up having here is you already have now a shift conception of god right, first right um he is still using old christian vocabulary but a new ontology going on um and so god is basically only given the space to ground his own um consciousness right, right. right? so he, um and, the, and and that and that becomes the ground but really it becomes the ground of his whole his whole willed reality. I'll, I'll, I'll get to Descartes in a minute. So so one of the things you see shift here now is God now inside the box, not, not the source of the whole box. God now conceived as power. Intelligence is basically nothing more than the, the instrument of that power. The created order now is not aimed towards any inherent intelligibility, but it is marked by an arbitrariness which could change. And so that means there's no longer a real telos for which we as creatures are meant to enact. There is no nature I have to somehow enact. It's 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 arbitrary, right? And then then um, and then along with that, we have a new definition of everything else. Now what you begin to have is a new view of creation and nature. Nature now automatically starts to be conceived as its own power, and on the same chain with that. And now there becomes a competition, right? If God is power on the same order and then nature is power, well, isn't it a violation of the freedom of create nature to impose your laws upon it, right? <laughs> and then the next thing is human nature, right? Isn't it a violation of my being a power center to impose your higher authority and power on me? It's not necessarily a good. It may just be an arbitrary whim of some arbitrary creator. Then history. History is nothing more than the process, maybe, of this arbitrary. So maybe history has its own kind of power to it. This is where you get Hegel, right? You get Schopenhauer, the will to be of history. Um, so, so what you have is basically, we call them in philosophy, ontic relations. There's no longer different ontologies. What you have is different beings within the economy of being, which is governed by nothing outside of it. And, and God is conceived as the biggest thing around, the biggest power center, basically imposing an arbitrary will on everything. So guess what you have here? You have two new views of the relationship developed between God and everything else. One is the similarity thesis. This is what uh, Jason was saying, univocal language. God is just like everything else, just a bigger example of it. So we're just like God, God's just like us. And so really, if God is, uh, is the kind of ultimate being, if you will, for us to be anything like God would be in some sense for, for, to bring God down manageable, right? Make manageable by us or by nature, right? Um, so there's similarity. So when we talk about God, it's basically, you know, like you said, just a, just a super creature. The terms are not analogous. They mean the same. The flip side is if we're going to talk about any kind of transcendent God— we have to talk about it in terms of opposition and conflict, right? So if we're like this, then God must be like opposite of that, right? And so this is where you get later, you'll get Kant's two stories, right? Um, the, you know, the difference between transcendence and imminence. But see, the, the, the notion of classic Christian transcendence was simply the being of God is such that it is utterly distinct in and of itself. And so it's free, it's transcendence is such that it can be closer to creation than it is to itself, 
because it always is the source of it yet transcends it. So whereas this view is mm-hmm. So is it is it fair as you're talking it seems like um is it fair to say that Kant isn't so much the creation of creating anything so much as he's kind of like the person who is running with the ideas and, and extending them further into reality. So these things are already existing before yeah. Kant. The realities are existing before Kant. Yeah. But he's yeah. actually the one who decides to start principally acting on these further into reality. Is that fair enough to say? Yeah. I mean, I think I think there, there's a whole line. I think Jason had mentioned some early of, of, of figures. Descartes would be, he really yeah. kind of brings it much further and then Kant kind of wraps it up. So with Descartes, just get get up close to Kant now, with Descartes, you really have something, you know, developing as well. Um, one thing is you have this this new dualism um, between really the the spiritual part of the human versus the material part, mm. and this comes again because of the oppositional view of of God. You have to get here. Creation, you have to right? get here. No longer because yeah, because if you're destroying the creator yeah. apart, you have to destroy the creation apart too. You can't and do yeah. that. So you got to split him in the same way. This just makes complete sense. It's the logical and, conclusion. Of doing That's, that, and so they just go with yeah. Gnosticism and again. So now, because it worked, because it worked in the <laughs> yeah, ancient well, world. This is, yeah. this is, well, and this is kind of what happens here, because the material world, therefore, is is something of what you know. It really doesn't have a teleology. I mean, Darwin will eventually come and chop the whole teleological, you know, root later. But but I mean, this is what's going on. So there is no teleology. There is no form to our natures, material natures. There is no shape that is binding. Um, it's arbitrary. And this is why I can switch my gender anytime I want, because there is no, this is basically plastic and I can do what I want to. The true me is the spiritual part, which is grounded in a transcendental ego, if you will, a, a divine power, which is identical with my consciousness to which there barely is any difference. So God grounds my consciousness as basically being God <laughs> filtered through my finite embodiedness and therefore i basically become the ground of all things i think therefore god we is, call that idolatry right? yeah. I think <laughs> well, and, we call it idolatry. And, kant, kant yeah. called it transcendent <laughs> transcendental subjectivity that was his phrase he, he yes. yeah the transcendental subjectivity well, that's right that's right so 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 transcendence really is immanentized within the human right in 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 this kind of part of us that isn't material and therefore this is that which basically allows this this kind of um larger power to ground me made in that image so that i can be kind of a form of that in and govern the way a god would i become the moral legislator of myself and my thoughts and everything else i become a contributor to the imposition of meaning and form onto the world. So basically when Kant comes around, that's what he's doing. He wants to say that we can't know reality in itself. There may not even be an inherent telos. All we can know is it filtered through our senses and then governed through our consciousness, which is is basically has a presupposition of God grounding it so it can step up above our material nature. And through that, we can freely um, enact categories of rationality and meaning and then um, enact the moral law within us and basically conform reality to our our power if ultimately our capacity well, and, and not um, our categories are active and, yep. go, i'm mm-hmm. sorry jason i stepped on you go no, ahead no please um it's and it's not at least from what i'm seeing it's not just coming up with those but also to impose those realities well, right. So th- that that does come along, so, but what you have is you have Descartes. He he separates us from uh, the the nature of things, right? He, he's he's kind of doing an ontological uh, tap dance, separating us from the ability yeah. to know things as they are, to know things in their nature, and then and you've he got. Knows that? He well he he knows <laughs> so that just... it, it it's so he's already made the assumptions about uh the the he's already made the metaphysical assumptions he's trying to re- make sure he's he's trying to rescue knowledge can I know anything or not mm. right Leibniz who comes along right after he he runs it all the way to the end and says well if it's just reason 
then um, what what can we even call true knowledge? And it basically turns everything into a math problem. Um, what's really interesting is that Leibniz didn't actually write his own books. There was this pietistic, mm-hmm. this pietist pastor that sort of leaves the faith and become a Leibnizian, and he imposes <laughs> a reasonableness onto onto Leibniz that maybe Leibniz didn't have himself. Um, but it, he takes the the pietistic categories of uh, he he kind of pietism is this rationalized Lutheranism where uh, Lutheranism was a communal understanding of the faith. It had a a strong sacramental theology. It had a strong understanding of the presence of God in creation, uh, that God was uh, in, with, under, around everything, right? A strong understanding of the transcendental um, imminence of God in creation. Pietism says, Actually, I think God has a only has a relationship with me individually, um, and that there's this direct individualism um, that Pietism brings. When a Pietistic pastor leaves the faith, he imposes that kind of understanding onto Leibniz's thought, and then publishes everything under Leibniz's name, um, and you have a, a in, very individualistic rationalism that. Uh, it, that becomes Leibniz's published thought. And Hume comes along and is like, that's nonsensical. <laughs> y- you can't know anything in that setting, right? You you end up knowing nothing because there isn't any information that doesn't come in through the senses. We don't have direct rational access to the nature of anything because we are limited creatures that limited beings that only have access to knowledge through our senses. So if that's true, then not, then you don't really have any knowledge left. Kant steps in right there and says, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. I think I can rescue knowledge. Um, but that, in that setting, right? With your assumptions, I think I can rescue knowledge. And he writes three volumes, a critique of prior reason, a critique of practical reason, and a critique, oh, what's the third one? Slipping my mind, but it's- Something on future metaphysics, (laughs) one of his. Uh, So one of them is an attempt to say, we can still know truth. One is an attempt to say, we can still know goodness. And one of them is an attempt to say, we can still know beauty. In this setting in which uh, the subject, a rad- um, there's not objectivity. We can't know an object directly. Um, we can only know objects via our own subject. Um, and this is what Dr. Price is talking about, that we then take our perspective, our subjectivity, and there is a way for us to have universal subject, universal subjectivity, universal subjective knowledge that isn't knowledge directly of the nature of things, because we can only bring in information through our senses as a subject. But our subjectivity is such that we can impose a universal nature onto the world through our subjective imposition of transcendental knowledge yeah. via our subjectivity. So the the center of knowledge is no longer that there is a nature within the objects that we're seeing, but the center of knowledge now becomes our own experience of the things. Our own subjectivity imposes a universal nature, nature according to, to Kant. And there's so many words, right? It's like 4,000 pages for these three volumes. There's so many words that a lot of people are convinced. And and it's it's some of the worst writing. I I hate reading, really. What's hard is... Jason said that earlier, too. Yeah, what's hard is... It, it, he says so many words <laughs> that it almost feels like it must be true, right? Yeah. There's so much ink that it, and yeah. so a lot of people run with it and say, "I think, I think maybe he has, I think maybe he's proved it, right?" But it's ju- it's really just an overwhelming number of pages that nobody can so, understand. <laughs> so, so work with me, because so the, we're talking about being in conversation with Kant now. 
So we have this yes. world before Kant, the world that Kant comes into, what Kant brings to the conversation, trying to rescue it. Abso- absolutely not. <laughs> right. But Fails. what what does yeah. in, 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 how is it how is it that we, even as Christians right now, are in conversation with Kant and don't even know it? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, that's, I'll that's, that's, throw just a little mm-hmm. thing in there. Kant ruled the world okay. for about a hundred years, right? And a lot of times, mm-hmm. Christians, because we're conservative, what we don't realize is we're actually arguing. We're what we're trying to conserve is Kant. Um, and a lot of people yeah. came along, the modernists, the postmodernists, and they said, "No, Kant doesn't make sense. Kant doesn't." doesn't win and we say oh yeah well we're christians we conserve and so we're trying to conserve a kantian uh epistemology thinking we're being conservatives well we thinking that you know so we're we're actually only going back to you know maybe a we're 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 going back to the 1900s which is not far enough so (laughs) then but flesh that flesh that out a little more like give me when you say we're only conserving Kant, so we're not we're fighting against postmodernism with Kant. How how would you see that in how we're fighting? Because I think a lot of people who would be listening would be like, we would never do that. We're Christians. <laughs> we're using our Bibles, right? right? Dude, go go for it. Well, I mean, I I think yeah. Well, well I think uh, let me back up a little bit and just say that one of the things I think the key, key point is is that Kant brings in is, is something uh, Jason said, but a good definition of it is he brought the, the the subjects creative intellectual powers to have a constitutive role mm. in the way the knowledge about the world is construed. Mm. In other words, rather than our intelligence participating in an intelligible creation in which the the things we confront, different creatures and ours, have almost a fusion of being, if you will, and that's how we learn intelligibility, which was the way the classic world did, because these things participate and have intelligibility. Um, and and um, what happens here is is the intelligibility is 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 the intelligibility of us as individual subjects. And for Kant, he believed this was a universal thing we all shared in. So we have these categories of causality, non-contradiction, you know, what, whatever, time, space, all these. We are the ones imposing that on reality. So we can never really know the world apart from our filter on it. And our filter is active. It's not passively receiving the world. It's actually construing the world. So, and this is a willed reason. This is kind of something hard to get a hold of. It's not just pure. He calls it pure reason. But it's, it's a reason not governed in higher intelligibility, but really in the self-assertion of the moral subject. Um, and this is why he will even say, God, you know, you can't reason your way to, to God in any metaphysical sense. He's already working with a, a different ontology here. But then he says, but it, God can be the presupposition of your moral life, right? Mm. It's a contentless God, but God serves as basically the, the, the grounds for making sense of our, our moral life and action. Um, and so, but I think a, a way of putting it is all, I mean, there's a real radical immanentizing of, of theology going on here in which, which God becomes almost, um, we become similar to God and to the point that later humanism will basically be is, is God is really just a projection of ourselves. Why do we need to be similar to God when we actually you know, in some ways, our God, you know, that's what kind of some yeah. kind of humanisms. So what you get with Kant right to the garden. is a move to something a, a little bit more radical with his one of his the later thinkers, uh, Fichte or Fichte, F-I-C-H-T-E. Um, he, and I'll give you a good quote. I, w- I won't go long here, but you'll see where this goes. So he's going to radicalize Kant, right? And so what, what he has here is, he, he puts it this way, he... Um, he goes, as has often been said, independence, freedom, which is our ultimate goal. Again, and this is what Jason was saying, this view needed to free itself from the mechanistic world of our embodied natures. This consists in the fact that everything depends on me and I depend on nothing. Doesn't that <laughs> sound familiar? They want us to be the classic Christian God here, dependent on nothing, and yet everything depends on it. Blasphemy. You see the reversal yeah. here, yeah. The, the, the blasphemy? And said um, that 
um, that what I will occurs in the complete world of senses, that it occurs absolutely and merely through the fact that I will it, in the same way that it occurs in my body, the starting point of my, ac- um, my absolute causality. So my body now, therefore, conformed to myself as basically the free, independent God, um, becomes the imposer of all meaning. Um, and this leads to this kind of, notice this, this libertarianism. This is what gets into the church. We all want to be libertarians in relationship to politics, talking freedom, but we don't realize we need to kind of tease out the difference between Christian freedom, which is truthful enactment of our creaturely natures within a a creation ordered to its creator, versus libertarian conceptions of the Enlightenment, which basically means that I, just like God, can spontaneously generate out of my unpremised will, whatever I want and whatever I think and impose it on things. I am the ground of all meaning and truth out of my sheer act of will. It's, it's libertarianism is I need nothing that hinders my ability to sheerly enact what I want, how I want it and what I so think. As long as I don't hurt anybody. And so right? true. Yeah. <laughs> as, as long, long as, as I yeah. don't hurt anybody. Yeah, that's right. And, and you, but the conception of the human, Mm-hmm. Well, and you, what what you get is people start to realize this and run this down, and you get uh, French philosophers like Sartre. You get Albert Camus, um, he who he wrote yeah. Nausea, where he said, um, "I have realized that I can't have any of this because I didn't create myself. I I didn't bring myself into yeah. being, and so all of this yeah. it becomes." He says, "It makes me nauseous." to realize that I didn't create myself. Yeah. Um, and so you've got this, the, eventually the ideas run themselves out and you get the, the, yeah. the only question left is, do I commit suicide or not? Right. Though That's what you get with the French yeah. existentialists running this to its end, but they yeah. didn't see it right away. And, um, but as mm-hmm. Christians, we need to learn to identify it. We need to learn to see it. But that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to figure out because I don't think I can go. I can go. We were talking about this time with the Southern Baptist Convention. If they knew and this and Southern Baptists, and I'm glad that we haven't made this a beat up on Baptist conversation because I think I think <laughs> it could easily go to <laughs> well, everybody's operating in it, you know. But um, yeah. They would never think for a second that they're operating exactly how you just described, where they're the ones who are imposing their own reality on this. Um, that. They need to protect like libertarianism. Like they would never think that that's how they're operating. They think that they are operating according to the dictates of scripture. How do you then go into that world and say, my brother, you are in conversation with Kant. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I know we don't want to make it a beat up on Baptist thing, but, but here we go. <laughs> no, no, so, but, I mean, think, here, think about your mic a little bit. Think, think about the way we talk about, baptism and as an infant baptist i have been told by baptists you can't impose a decision about Mm -hmm. what kind of religion your kid is going to have Mm. without their without them having a choice in it right religion is the kind of thing that you have to choose right because that is upper level knowledge of that that's what uh the oh you better shut up the, dis- Jason. the distinction noumenal and phenomenal is that's what kant makes right that you've got this yeah. upper level yeah. kind of knowledge that has to do with metaphysics and then the noumenal has to do with scientific knowledge and you can't impose uh be because you're taking away the freedom to choose and and i've been told god would never do that right god the god is a God, God actually does do right, that. I mean, here, here's the thing. How, how much say did that infant have in bringing itself into being and sustaining right. its being? Yeah. Or being born in your house. <laughs> so why is new, why is new being any right. different? If, if, if we didn't choose to be born, why would we choose to be born again? Right? Like that, it's, that's a good example. Yeah. And see the, and see, the other point, the other point is, a, again, a competitive view of God's agency and the creatures. Um, God's, see, what baptism is doing is it's referring to the divine agency on another order of yeah. being. 
it doesn't mean that the child is never going to choose this on their order of being. There's no inconsistency with them choosing it and God choosing. Right. What it's doing is, is it's reflecting in a creaturely way what, what is a means of grace, but a transcendence um, in, in, in bringing itself into a, into a creaturely and exhibiting a divine relation. And it's saying that in a higher order of being, you're claimed by God mm. prior to your choice. But the freedom, mm. the freedom of right? God and the freedom of creatures, we, we act like it's ping pong balls and who, and if you take some of them out of the trunk, yeah. If you put God's freedom into the trunk, you have to yeah. take some of the human freedom out of the trunk because, but they're not the same sort of thing because they're not, we're not ontologically the same sort of thing. So infant baptism is saying God is a different kind of being than us, whose will is a different kind of thing than our will. Mm. And so, um, and, and it's gift, 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 gift. Right. Um, every baptism yeah. is an infant baptism because God's will is the kind of will that is so different. It is not the same. It's not the same sort of will than as ours. So his gift brings um, new life, just like. A yeah, gift we don't have life. to. We don't have to. Yeah. I mean, Baptists, sadly, on that end, have adopted a very modernist view um, of, of the world or the, or the and, modern and, world and has, a, the this... modern world has adopted a Baptist view. I mean, historically speaking, yeah, which one it, came well, first? there is, there, there, there is some of that. And I, I think again, mm -hmm, I but SCOTUS yeah, helps lead the way with all mm -hmm. that. And Kant, Kant really solidifies it. So what are some things, like you said, that we can look at the way in which the church has been impacted? And, and again, I think, there are a lot of these key ways have to come first. One is we have to re retrieve a proper understanding of Christian transcendence. That is not simply that God is other than us, but it's the way we conceive it. We have to understand from that a proper understanding of creation as gift and therefore not on the same plane as the action of God being of God. God is more present to it than it is to itself, yet transcendently so. And so God is um, closer to you than you are to yourself, as St. Augustine said. And because of that, in him, we enact our creatureliness, not in opposition to him. Um, sin enters in when we oppose what our creatureliness, <laughs> right? Mm, that's good. It's an opposition of what we're creating. That's yeah, really it's good. an opposition of what we're created to be, image bearers of God. And and so and so well, what you know, was really redemption from that. But it, one mm -hmm. of the things that I thought found really interesting when I first started studying this was that a lot of modern philosophers, uh and modern modernist Christians, kind of post neo Orthodox Christians, they accused Augustine, um Jonathan Edwards, Thomas Aquinas of being pantheists, right? because God was so yeah. close to the creation that you, they say, we, you know, Augustine yeah. says you can find God in a tree because um, the God, the tree is downstream in its creative force and in its creatureliness, it's downstream from the being of God uh, or from the uh, beauty of God. Right. And so in the tree, if you accept it properly, then it is a stream through which you can swim up to God. He said, and they would say, well, that's just pantheism. But it's because they had made a error of an ontological yeah. assumption reading that yeah. God, if God is closer to we are to I am closer to me than I am to myself, there's a maybe a panentheism or something. But but. To, to, well, to, well, I think both, both pantheism. of those, are, pantheism and panentheism, are are two errors. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I tell you what they do. They get the, yeah, they get the, they get the identity issue wrong. Right, exactly. Pantheism identifies God and creation as two two sides of the same. There, there's an identity. Um, so when you get Christian, the Christian view wrong, there are two things that two poles that mistakes. The one pole is it would be something similar to like a um, what what you could call pan everything is <laughs> that basically God is the only reality yeah. and everything else is a kind of a shadowy nothing in relationship to it. That's not Christianity. God is God in God's own order of being and is the one from whom, through whom, and to whom 
are a distinctly other kind of creature which depends on God for its own being. But it has its own being dependent on God. It has its own nature given to it by God. It's not autonomous. It's always dependent, but they're not the same thing. God, it may be similar to God in its creaturely gifts, but it is never, God is never similar to it. There's no identity, right? So when, when the error comes in and basically it doesn't have that properly in place, then all of creation basically gets absorbed either into God or um, somehow is the body and God is the soul, right? That's yeah. panentheism. Neither right. of those are the classic Christian view. The classic Christian view is God. God is always imminent, transcendently, never identical with, always the fullness of being where creatures are nothing but a creaturely share in that gift. The second one error is called um, not kind of pan everythingism, but is another kind of pantheism. And this is that the world or the creation is everything. And God is basically nothing more than an expression of, or a projection of the world or, or nature. Um, right, and this is what Freud and 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 the rest of those would hold that basically the the world is that infinite source of everything, and God is sort of an epiphenomena or a projection of it its um, you know creaturely groanings or something. So uh, that's how, that's how I would distinguish yeah. those. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, you guys have my head spinning. You guys <laughs> could talk. Pop of, <laughs> this is insane. Um, there's a couple things running through my head. And I just want to throw them out here and I'll let you guys kind of pick off which ones you want to hit. Um, as you're talking and you're going through pan everythingism and panthe- all those, I'm, I'm thinking, man, we have to get this right. Because we're yeah. not talking about ideologies and things in our, that are in space or in our head. This we're talking about the very nature of the world itself how I treat my yep. kids, how I decide to operate with mm-hmm. my wife, with my family, salvation itself, <laughs> politics, all of this stuff. Yeah. We're not just talking about ideas. And, and we I got this from you, Dr. Right. Price. Ideas don't have consequences necessarily. They're, they're products of something, but it's the, the, the ideas themselves are the very consequences <laughs> of the thing that's yeah, before yeah, them. Yeah. And I haven't <laughs> forgotten that. And I'm in yeah. the reality, reality is, is that if we got, you know, if I got Kantianism, I'm functioning that way it is having a massive effect on the world, the way that I think about the world and how it actually exists. Right. And I am yeah. in some way or another, yeah. maybe not as conscious as I want to. I'm blaspheming, not knowing it. Right. Or I'm blaspheming and unconsciously engaging in it and, yeah. and functioning in a false reality of the world. Mm-hmm. The second thing that I'm thinking about. So I got to figure out how I got to make this touchdown. The other thing is, man, what happens when these kind of things get in our gospel? <laughs> yeah. Like if Kant is in our gospel. Yeah. Boy, that we it, it would explain a whole lot about how we do worship, how we evangelize how we baptize, right? How we show, you yeah. know, this has been my thing with baptism. I've always, you know, I've when I became a pedo baptist the thing that I saw the that was worse than everything else is all sorts of theological issues that are there. It was how Baptists chose not to allow fellowship with Presbyterians in churches and becoming members. And that said, wait, 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 you can't tell me publicly mm-hmm that we shouldn't disagree over baptism and then yet won't take my membership because I didn't do it the way that you wanted me to do it. So there's something underneath that. That's not <laughs> yeah. right. And yeah. so, so if Khan is in our gospel, he's in, in a lot of our practice and the way that we think about this, man, we got some serious issues here. And so I guess one way yeah. I want to work through for me, maybe, and you guys take at this, how do we get Kant and to get out of the conversation with Kant, both in the practical applications of our lives, that how we're operating, and secondly, if is Kant in our gospel? And if he's in our gospel, hmm. how do we see it and identify it? And how do we get him out? <laughs> I just I just opened up a huge can of worms for another two hours. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, well. 
Well, and I know, I mean, I, I know, t- t- let's, let's, you know, a lot of people, I, I'm not someone, if you notice, one of the things that in my, in my approach to theology is, is I'm not someone who ha- it works with dialectical oppositions, right? This person's bad. This person's good. Right. That irritates me in the evangelical world in particular. Oh, my God. He mentioned Bart and Bart had an illegitimate relationship. So nothing he said could ever be OK. Yeah, I've been right? resisting yeah. mentioning. I'd hate, I'd hate I've to been be that re- person on judgment. I've been day. resisting but, mentioning Bart over here. Just just just. But, <laughs> but, but here's something something to Bart's credit is Bart was steeped in Kantian liberal theology and and tried to draw upon classic Christian sources to subvert yeah. it. Um, the problem with Bart is I don't think he ended up being successful, but at least he, he pointed us to say retrieval of classic sources, retrieval of the doctrine of the Trinity, retrieval of the doctrine of the incarnation understood with a proper Christian view of transcendence. He didn't break it, but he at least understood where the issue was. Um, but so how, how do we do it? Well, there's a, there's a lot of different things. I mean, one thing is, is the work that, that I'm up to is really a lot of the retrieval work of, of really correcting these wrongs. The sad part, we come up with a lot of opposition from alternative schools of philosophy in the evangelical world, those that I think improperly attack people who, who draw on classic Christian uh, resources as, you know, trying to, you know, Catholicize the the church or Hellenize the church and all of this, all the while they're importing their own variation of either Hegel or naturalism, Kantianism under a new cloak, and I I would say a pagan view of God. So um, I think retrieval work is very important, immersing ourselves in the mind of the church and not being afraid because we're not scared because the God of truth, we're reading this with our scriptures, right? Um, Secondly, um, what we need to do is is accept the fact that we probably have not only idols that we hold to and we need to be weaned from in deeper truth, but we have ill and wrong conceptions of of the metaphysics of creation as gift and 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 how it's to be understood, but also the wrong interpretations usually of what it means to be a human being made in the image of God. Mm. I think that is the key war. That's where the war is taking place right now. If you notice, one of the things that that the the I think I would I call them kind of the anarchists, uh, the, the you know the 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 kind of those ready to destroy the world to rebuild it from the ground up people, right? The the social justice wokesters and all the rest. They have their antenna on something. They understand that the form of family of institutions, is something that is malleable. They understand it's malleable. What they don't understand is it it, it is an ingredient with the order of nature. It's given by God the creator. So how much they want to play with it is going to run up against a limit, but they can do damage. But their mistake is is they think by breaking and, 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 and breaking that gift of form, they're somehow going to liberate the cre- creation to to really embrace, you know, its true form. What they have is a perverted sense of creation and perverted sense of redemption or eschatology. Mm. They think that basically you cre- creation needs to be re- redone through progress, right? To reshaping these things based on what though? What tell us are they guided by? And I bet you that same telos and purpose is the same thing governing most of our conceptions of what it means to be a Christian in our church. Oh, you shut up. We share, mm. we share the same view of liberation from old hierarchies to freedom from any, yeah, the notion of freedom, what it means to be a self or, or a non-self, social construct. I mean, what is that? That there is no inherent reality. There is no created order. It's all the construct of our will to power, right, um, to protect our privileges. I mean, all of that. Now, let me say something again. We have to recognize in our attempts to conserve the created goods that they are steeped in sin and they need renewal and and restoration and reorienting towards the transcendent. They do. So we can't just say, oh, things as they are is okay. That's the point of Christ coming and the Spirit coming, right? But the question is, it's about it's about 
them being vindicated in the resurrection, Christ resurrects bodily, they're vindicated, and then they're brought to their perfection. And that's the work we're to be about. So I think we need to get a hold of the, you know, the whole rich set of metaphysical implications of the Bible and the right biblical ontology to read the Bible properly and engage the uh, the idols that we're dealing with. Um, and that's hard work because we're all wanting to think that if we just you know, break down a particular passage, that's going to be getting at all these issues. Right. That's what um, I want to hear. It can because <laughs> the ontology is there. Yeah. It, it can. Yeah. But we have to be challenging our, our you know, our, our idols while we do it. It's, you know, um, yeah. and then we need to embody a different way of life, you know? Well, Jason, before, before you jump in, I just want to um, say this real quick, too. Um, you know, Dr. Price, you said that... Um, Last time we talked a couple years ago, and it stuck with me, and it's uh, something I've been thinking about talking with Jason. He's really anchored a lot of this for me, too, so that I'm understanding that your eschatology and your creation theology have to match up. And what people th- <laughs> seem, to, seem to think right now in our theological circles is that they can have an eschatology that is different from their creation theology. So you see inside of dispensationalism yeah. and some of all millennialism and some of others, uh, yeah. you see this disconnect from creation so that when people get saved, they have yeah. no idea ultimately what they're to do. So they have to create something else there, which I think yeah. is yeah. kind of where, where Kantianism comes into play there and helps that fill that void of the creation mandate and theology yeah. so that once you get saved, you're kind of doing your own thing here, you know, instead of yeah. restoring salvation, pointing back to the intended yeah. uh, command for man to do and to go and to uh, embark upon as he models from heaven on earth. Right. And so yeah. Yeah. there is a breakdown in our theology that we think our theology can be fragmented and not, unified and we can still somehow end up in the place that we want to end up in the real world. And that just doesn't, that you're just not going to get that. And so there, there is a, a, I'm not pushing necessarily. Well, I guess I am. I'm pushing. (laughs) I want to look beyond. Yeah. I'm pushing. (laughs) I'm thinking the pair of your creation (laughs) theology and your eschatology. Listen, you get that, you get that wrong. One of those wrong. And then what you do in the middle, it becomes a reality of what you believe about the two ends. (laughs) Right. Yeah. That's Yeah. That's, that's a, you actually indirectly uh, hit on a topic that I think we can avoid before we finish. And that is um, what happened really to the, the nature of, of our conception of normal reality after the enlightenment and Kant. And this is where I think this is where it gets a little bit crazy. And so you got to bear with me with this. OK, this is something I'm just I'm really starting to get a hold of. And then, Jason, I'll give you the last because, word. If you know it. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah, no, 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 this is a great. I mean, this so, is so one much fun. of the things I am joining. <laughs> so one of the things that you'll see about the classic Christian vision is it didn't a lot of the theologians. It wasn't even in their imagination to have what we would today call define as our ordinary experience, basically very one dimensional, right? Um, It was a very, the creation itself was filled with layers of meaning and purpose on all these different levels. This is why even in the, in the early church, you had, you had the the, the literal reading of the text, but that is, that did not mean that which is defined by a naturalistic historic science, right? That's not what literal meant. It meant this, the, 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 the story of redemption. That's what, that's what was really typically meant. That which held, holds together the whole scripture, the, 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 the ordinary sense of the meaning of this. Now, what happens is in the classic vision, um, we have the uh, classic biblical ontology and metaphysic privileged liturgy and worship language and even would use a lot more analogous language and different kinds of language to reference true reality whereas after scotus and everything shares one kind of being one kind of meaning becomes determinative of everything so if you find that one ordinary meaning through science 
or through history, historical science or this, that governs what ordinary, the, the literal means. So it's a, it flattens everything down to one dimension, and it doesn't deal with the, the, the different planes of being that the old language worked through. And so what happens is even when we, we were committed to the authority of Scripture and we're reading it right out of its plain sense, we're still reading it on one dimension of reality, usually interpreting those things the way we experience them now or the way they're interpreted from a very one plane of reality interpretation. And because of that, we're not reading the scripture in the classical literal sense. This is why, for example, if you read Augustine's literal commentary on Genesis, do you want to see how different it is than anything you're you're seeing put out today? Really? Now, I'm not, I know where people go with that, and I'm not saying either or, because that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is we have to wean off of a secular, if you will, or naturalist, or or what I would say, an alternative view of literal, and recapture that robust sense of literal and language of classic of classic Christian vision, governed by that that plain sense. Anyway, that was yeah. a chock full. But there's a lot of implications because yeah. we read the scriptures, importing what those things mean from what we think they mean based on our common experience or interpretation. Which makes sense because after 2020 hit, I realized nobody, not only could they not read the Bible, they couldn't read anything. Yeah. Right. It wasn't just scripture. They didn't, they didn't, they couldn't read the constitution. They couldn't read right. old papers from yeah. 17, yeah. you know, they, they couldn't read anything <laughs> and make sense out yeah. of it. Yeah. But, Go ahead, Jason. But, yeah. but it's because we have, we have been dehumanized by a Kantian worldview. Yeah. We've lost our humanity. We've lost our ability to live like human beings. And language is a distinctly human Imago Dei aspect of who we are. And we cannot read anymore, right? We cannot read because we're not humans. Yeah. Only humans can read, right? We've been mm. dehumanized by our own understanding of ourselves. And Kant, he emphasizes or he gives... Uh, preference to scientific knowledge. The entire critique of pure reason is proof yeah. that you can still have a scientific knowledge. And he just says, I'm trying to save science because science is true knowledge. Right. And, and yeah. what, and he has actually, yeah. he along with the enlightenment shifts the meaning of the word science. Right. Whereas before you'd say, well, theology yeah. is a queen of the sciences. You say, well, theology isn't science. Yeah. Right. That's a different kind of knowledge altogether. Yeah. That's Kant. Kant says yeah. theology yeah. is a different kind yeah. of knowledge. So he has shifted what knowledge means, shifted uh, all of that. Um, yeah. And and so what we what my prescription is is learn to say thank you about 150 times more often a day, right? To look mm. around at the world and say <laughs> thank you for it because. That's what it means to be a creature. It's all a gift, right? You're driving down the road and you've got a whole line of frozen yeah. trees. Stop and say, "Oh Lord, what do you thank you for that? Look at all that. That's beautiful. What what's it saying to me? What what might a frozen tree mean? Right? The church is a kind of tree. What what might a frozen church mean? And how can I learn? Right? Just a, start asking questions. You can't answer them. I trust me. I promise you, you can't answer them. But start learning to ask that question. What? Because because if you can't learn to read the creation, which is God's book to you all around you, you're never going to learn to read his second book, which is the scriptures, right? And if you can't learn to read the scriptures, which is the second book, you're not going to learn to read the first book, which is creation, because you're not learning to say thank you for it and treating like it's communication, right? Treating it like it's, and then, uh, but who is going to be able to read it? Well, hopefully your kids. So start reading books that have massive doses of hierarchy in them all over the place, right? Read them king arthur read them the lord of the rings right things because the the our understanding of authority has been so re-centered on you and your internal state your your understanding of authority is broken right and um that that you live in a world in which uh, authority and hierarchy is a gift and we have said no thank you 
right? And learning to uh, <laughs> recenter our mind around a, the poetic assumptions of the Bible and the uh, hierarchical assumptions uh, of the Bible and the the gift that all of that is, I think is a first step because it's something practical that you can do. Uh, but the the and knowing that uh, you're also embracing a historical a, a God that acts in history, which means your goal is that your kids are the ones that have uh, that are stepping in this direction, right? You're how can I help my kids step? away from Kant. Um, and some, you know, and so the reason I go after hierarchy is there's a really great book, uh, the heavenly city of the 18th century philosophers in which it tracks the mm. change of the use of the word law from pre Kant yes, to after yeah. Kant. I, I have that book. Oh, it's yeah, beautiful. Good book. It's wonderful. Yeah. And, it, and what mm -hmm. he, the whole conception of high, of the, the universe and it, the hierarchy of a, the the universe with God as the ultimate authority and then God enacting into the world his authority via the scriptures as a public, a universal public literary authority that then establishes other authorities in the world, that all, all of that goes away and instead law becomes our way of describing the things that we have seen that we can expect to happen again, right? Law after Kant is something that we impose by our subjective uh, subjective observations onto the world. So we say a uh, <laughs> law is, you say, oh, it's a law of nature, right? A law of nature before Kant was a phrase that meant something different than a law of nature after yeah. Kant or after the 18th century. So um, hierarchy is something that we just, we don't have any conception of, right? Raise your kids on, uh, on King Arthur so that they wish they had <laughs> someone to kneel before, right? The beauty of hierarchy so that they'd start looking around at the people around them and thinking, wouldn't it be glorious if I could, if we could all submit to one another in love? That's such a beautiful idea. Kant says, submit to one another in love. <laughs> that sounds like slavery, right? Right. And, and, yeah. and we have we have Im, uh, swallowed whole the wrong conception of submission of hierarchy. And we have. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I, I'm just thinking of where do you start? Um, you know, just dive. Uh, Edmund Burke talks about the taste of the formation, right? Forming the taste of the next generation. Edmund Burke is considered the father of conservatism. And he talks about the importance of art and beauty and, um, and being the ones that produce the art, the beautiful art, so that the taste of the next generation is formed by us, right? Form that, that we form the tastes of the next generation, because that is where the real, uh, that that's where that's the steering wheel, uh, is the, the, uh, the tastes, what they consider beautiful, right? And and now we say your facts don't care about our feelings. Or facts don't care about your feelings, right? And we think yeah. that's conservatism. <laughs> that's right. Not. My feelings don't care about your facts. <laughs> yeah, right. You know. So, and, and and just simply, the best and and you you don't have to go long on this at all. But just the simple identifiers for me to know that I'm in conversation with Kant would be what. You, you mean in terms of um, knowing that you're kind of um, marks that you can start to discern yes. whether Kant is showing up? Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah that, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, one, would, one would be, of course, um, thinking, um, thinking in a way in which your relationship to God is one of um, either similarity radical similarity or radical opposition mm. that's sign number one that there's a problem going on um if, if if you know that's number one. Second one would be the way in which we become the governing centers of meaning reality and our wants and desires um are not being um purified in light of 
true knowledge of God. In other words, what does Romans say? Basically, idolatry leads to a, a, a malformation of our loves. If we're created, in other words, we receive the gift of our natures from God, then we are, by nature, desirous of God. That's why we have desire, eros, in the old pagans. The problem is that, that with idolatry, that gets off. We still have desire. We still have loves. But we, as Augustine said, we're searching in the creaturely for that which only the creator can supply because God is love itself. Now, when we're returned to love itself, we begin to wean off those fake loves and relate to them as gifts, no longer as mere objects or other things that serve somehow to fulfill me the way only God does, right? So it, it shifts. So if you start relating to others as merely means to some end that you benefit from, rather than the sheer joy and delight of the gift that the other has for, for me and me for the other, then we're already leaving the Christian sphere and entering uh, in, in, in another domain. That's good. Um, another would be think, I mean, I, I, it's hard because sometimes, for example, I know the world in which a lot of our great apologists came out of a lot of the presuppositional line, yeah. but sadly they were addressing that world. And so they were right to address it the way they did, but it's not the only thing we have to um, deal with because we have to worry that we didn't in addressing it also incorporate some of it mm. sort of, God, you know, similar to Kant having um, God as a presupposition of the moral life, f turning God into a function that justifies our our um, epistemology or method or our well. Like Jason, so, we were just talking uh, about that. I'm <laughs> smiling over here because I was just saying yeah. the exact same thing. I mean, that's so <laughs> the funny. functionalization of God, right? The, the turning God into a function that grounds me or the Christian life or the Christian worldview rather than the Christian worldview being an exhibition of, of true knowledge of God. Yeah. So, I mean, these are things um, that we can be mindful of. Again, that, that doesn't negate all the goods. I'm just right, saying right. that everything, everything, um, I mean, similar to the way in which um, the other ki other kinds of apologists basically move move from assumed assumptions about the modern world as if they're, they're a given and try to build their case off of that. Um, but I think our moral lives in particular, family life and everything else, I mean, we tend to incorporate, like you said, a lot of the assumptions of, of psychology unfiltered um, and a lot of ends of psychology unfiltered. You know, it's all about my happiness and my contentment, my best life now, you know. Um, and and so we, we kind of lose that. But I, I mean, I think really the the big center, what I, I like to tell people is when you get the real Christian vision right, there isn't a conflict between the eternal and the temporal, heaven and earth. That's right. They're two different orders of being. Who we are is now grounded in Christ in the heavens, ontologically in the eternal. This is why this is eternal life, to know the Father and the one you sent, to be brought up into the divine life in communion through Christ's mediation. In that, now on earth, where, where your body still is before its, its perfection um, to, in, in the renewal of all things, you are heavenly minded while on earth, which means, yeah, you still have to do all the stuff here, but you're doing it now as centered, not out in conflict with the world, but drawing off of the third dimension, off of um, the transcendent and bringing that transcendent dimension into the here and now. That's that's the realization of, of the work of Christ, right? And so there isn't, there isn't a conflict that to pursue God first and love the kingdom above all things is at odds with loving my neighbor as myself. That's right. That the creaturely has a form when it is properly, properly oriented towards the infinite source of all things the right way. Mm. And I think that's healthy, healthy too. Um, there are so many things, and I think you know it's good to think about how how to start to notice where these ideas show up. And that's something I, I maybe need to think about more when we do another show is, you know, some places at which we can start looking to see if we're incorporating some of the unhealthy aspects of the Enlightenment mm -hmm. into distorting and eclipsing, you know, um, the goods that we have in, in, I think, the full Christian vision. Jason? Yeah, I would, I would, I would say that there's a couple, of, a couple of places. One is... Um, w keep an eye out for your complaining, right? Look at the things you complain about. Um, and 
and I, I would bet that most of the time you're complaining because you have an assumption about the world that is a false assumption, right? So the complaining is a sin, but it also is a window into your, uh, into your false assumptions, right? Whether you're trying to either resist your own limitations, right? You're complaining that God made you such a limited creature. The entire book of Ecclesiastes is about that God created you with limitations because he wants you to live by faith. And that's such a gift, right? The whole world is a gift, including your limitations, right? Um, or you're, you are, um, thinking that you're more important than you actually are, which it isn't, um, that's Kant's whole <laughs> thing, right? That the, that there's a radical transcendental subjectivity in which you become the center that imposes its understanding, uh, onto the world and that somehow makes a difference. But that's just not true, right? That's just, that actually is not true. But um, the, so that I would keep an eye at, and reflect upon why you complained, not just that you complained, right? When you complain, stop and say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me for my complaining because it's a sin. But don't just stop there. Then say, why did I complain? What, what, in me, um, what assumption in me came out as ungratefulness and actually dig into those places and let it be a window into your mistakes. And then what, just keep an eye out for those places where you're manipulative, right? Where you're trying to impose manipulatively your will on the people around you, especially in your marriage, um, but also on your kids. What are ways that you're, that, that you are manipulative and let those places be a window into your deeper, uh, the, the deeper errors that you're making so that you can not just submit your outward actions to the scriptures and submit your outward actions to the Lordship of Christ, but that you submit your assumptions, right? You, that, that you're looking for ways to get your assumptions to kneel before the throne of God as well. Um, and, because those are the, those are, I think the places that, uh, often, because we're embarrassed of our sins, we don't want to stop and meditate on our motivations, um, right? Because we're ashamed of them. But when when God, when you confess your sins and Jesus says, I forgive you, you really are separated as far as the East is from the West. Yeah. So you're not looking at yourself anymore, right? You're looking at something that's been separated from you. You can meditate on why was I manipulative? What made me think that it was that? I needed to apply coercion to my wife, emotional coercion to my wife to get her to do the thing that I wanted. What, what assumption am I making there that I need to also submit that to the Lordship of Christ so that I, um, you know, grow out of my, my, the, the enlightenment assumptions that I was. You shut up, Jason. Cause I'm thinking about my kids. <laughs> I, I don't want to think about any oh, of man. You just stop. No, I know. Now. You have to, I've had, I've had to go back to my kids so many times and be like, the way your dad treated you was sin. Will you forgive me? Yeah, I mean, and I, but here's the thing: like, I learned to do that from my wife. When we we had yeah. our first baby, and I watched my wife get frustrated at at our little cute little six month old daughter, and then say, <laughs> "Baby, will you forgive me?" I'm like, she can't even understand. And my my wife was like, it "Doesn't have anything to do with it, right?" I sinned against her, so I asked her to forgive me. That's <laughs> what we do. I was like, "Oh my gosh, you're so just." Mm. Right? I'm, so I'm that, I'm watching mm. the spirit work in my <laughs> wife and learning how deep my sin is because she's you know yeah. confessing her sin to our little baby, um, and I was like, how, "How do I learn to be to? How do I learn you know for that to be my my impulse?" Right. Like my impulse to my sin, because you're not going to stop sinning until you're raised from the dead. Right? How do I learn, yeah. though, for my impulse to be towards confession? Right. And I learned yeah. that it's because my wife, she digs when, you know, when she sins, she digs and says, what's the root there? I want to get out the, the root all the way out. And there's something you know, to Jane Austen, Jane Austen's 
you know, marry well because you'll become like who you marry. <laughs> There's something to that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, and, you know, as you guys are talking, all I'm thinking about, too, is, man, we need a massive um, supernatural work of the spirit oh, to be able to get there. Like this amen. doesn't happen yeah. apart from the spirit, you know. Right. Um, man, you guys yeah. have been phenomenal on all of it. I, I, we need to do this again. I also, before we go real quick, because I know, Doc, you got to run, too. But um, books, just throw out some books be some good books <laughs> we, we have a history here we make everybody buy books we should have an amazon channel yeah, but, yeah. buy books um well well i mean it, it you know it's there i mean if somebody wants to get a kind of uh, very in-depth um reading of kant and and his understanding of god i'm going to tell you now it's not easy but it is well written enough to you put a little labor in you'll get a benefit um, there is a book by Gordon uh, Michelson called Kant and the Problem of God, which he, he will basically argue that Kant really, his functional view of God is a hidden kind of atheism. Um, okay. But that is, that is the book. That's, that's been around a while. Um, I'm trying to think of something fresh that I've been reading that would um, really be, be worth uh, getting a hold of, but I don't know that a lot of these... Um, Oh, the, here is a good one in, in, in two books. I, I don't agree with all of the interpretation in it, but they, they do trace from the, from the ancient world all the way through the Enlightenment in different ways a lot of these themes. It's pretty technical, but one is Louis Dupre's book, Passage to Modernity, I've heard an of essay one. in the hermeneutics of nature and culture. And he kind of did one on the uh, Enlightenment, um, this one's called The Enlightenment in Intellectual Foundations in Modern Culture. Okay. Not easy reading. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I was going to say, now, what would you what would you push as far as like, here's the standard, like humanism, like, boom, Christianity. Read this, because if you don't read any, let's say that you, you don't have the chops to read any of those, or you're just like, you know, I don't want to read about Kant, but you said earlier, if I can know what the real is, Right. Then I can identify <laughs> the fake even better. Right. Like that's how they train people with fake money. Right. Like how do you identify a fake dollar bill? Well, you know what a real one looks like. So what would be like yeah. uh, you're pushing that direction? Push. That, that's a hard one. I, I and I don't want to be self-selling, but I am working on a book, yes. <laughs> um, which I aim, I'm aim to, I aim to have out this this summer. It's my goal. But what it is, is tying all this together, because really it's it's not tied together in many books. What it is, is it's, I, I get it from reading the, the whole of Christianity all the way, say, start with John of Damascus and his writing on orthodoxy, right? How did the early Christians understand the Trinity, God, creation? Um, not that we're going to agree with everything. I understand the significance yeah. of Reformation, all of that. But what we need to do is become immersed in the kind of thought world that the, these people, remember, these people you may not think all of them were, but these people were entrusted with being faithful to the gospel for their time and place, wherever yeah. they were. Yeah. A lot of them were persecuted and martyred for defending it. Sometimes we read Justin Martyr, who had a lot, read a lot of Plato and was a big philosopher. We're like, how in the world was he even Christian? And then you, you'd, you'd be, you ignore the fact that God used this person. Why did God use this person? What witness do they serve? They are not the same as scripture, but they obviously are people part of a living family of people in the resurrected Christ in whom what, what, uh, what some theologians call our brothers of the faith or our fathers in the faith. So let's honor our fathers um, in, in reading them and then, and then reading along. But I'm writing something on it. Uh, stay tuned. I haven't got a title yet, but it's going to be combining this classic uh, theological view of God and creation, then the ethical significance, and then I'm, I'm probably going to take it into terrain wrestling with with issues from technology and the oh, challenges wow. to reality. So, um, oh, wow, but if I good. think of some other things, yeah, if I think of some other books, I mean, there's always systematic theologies, but they don't always go into, I mean, even Turretin, Francis Turretin's is very good, but even he has gotten some some uh, some stuff in there a little bit <laughs> iffy at some places. <laughs> hey, Jason, well, and I think you what, can what, what, you what can just you always mean? assume that everybody's got something iffy. Like that's part of that's yeah, that's why exactly. you want to read widely is because everybody's got something iffy and yeah, you gotta get, it's about right. getting into conversation yeah. with them. I so I would recommend yeah. um, Philip Schaff's The Principle of Protestantism. Um, yeah. The, so yeah. where he really lays out what did the Protestants think Protestantism was, right? That which is 
Um, yeah. So they're they are pre Kantian, you know, the the Protestants, but they're also they're trying yeah. to reserve to to move forward while re- holding on to some of the uh, medieval uh, understandings of cosmology, especially. And uh, so the principle of Protestantism by Philip Schaff, the letters of Pope Gregory the uh, the Great. Well, all the Baptists just checked. Out I know. Half the Presbyterians. I know, but he. So it's before the Pope became the Pope, right? <laughs> the, so he, but he still got Pope. He's in got the name, the name Pope in the name, but it just meant Father, right? So it, pa- Papa, Papa Gregory, um, <laughs> he, but he, so he's a sixth century. Uh, he was the Bishop of Rome in the sixth century, um, and he had some misunderstandings of the role of the the Roman Bishop, but his letters are these. Um, wonderful. He's he's basically advising um, all of the missionaries on how to interact with um, with these strange heathens, um, and I think it gives it's a really great insight. He's he's right before he's one of the ways that God moved the world from the ancient church, the fathers, to the medieval church, and just re and just trust me the this dude loves Jesus so much and he was a blessing to the church and he talks and thinks a lot differently than we do. And just talk to him the way you do. If you, if you read, if you read the ancient church with good, uh, un- believing the best of them, um, it's such a, it's such a helpful conversation. Uh, GK Chesterton says it's important to read old literature because it keeps you from being simply modern. Right. Um, it, it just, it just, (laughs) hell, it's just good for us to get into conversation with these folks and, um, and don't let the, the Roman Catholic church claim everyone that was before Mm. Martin Luther, you know, those are our brothers and sisters. And sometimes they get stuff wrong. They did the church. The point of the Reformation was not to start a new church. It was to say that the church belongs to right. us. Rome is leading yeah. it. So the, when people say, oh, Thomas Aquinas, because they ran with Thomas. Sorry, Thomas belongs to us. Yeah. Sorry. What's, you know, hey, what's, yeah. Thomas Aquinas the, always gets so you turned up. Yeah. Yeah. What's really interesting. <laughs> That's right. In, in terms of the doctrine of God, John Calvin, he doesn't change anything from Thomas Aquinas. Right. Yeah. He he basically yeah. brings Thomas Aquinas' doctrine that's, of that's God. That's why there are Baptists that are mad at Calvin. I know. Now, right. He doesn't <laughs> he doesn't change anything in the doctrine of God from the as he he basically brings Aquinas into the the Protestant church in his institutes. It's and that's just I mean that there's we should yeah, we should yeah, we yeah, should just end right, end there, right yeah. there because yeah. that is and I, y'all starting <laughs> fight. We and already I'm, talked about the baptism stuff. Right, and I'm not a Thomas. <laughs> And I, I'm not a Thomist, right? I, but I, but I just think that's, I believe that is uh, historically honest. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't read. There's a different line of of the Reformation, the Peter Vermigli, mm-hmm. um, and the, the whole host of Luther. That it, it, the whole Reformed and and Protestant world is very yeah. rich yeah. theologically, and and in the early days, they they weren't they didn't work with simplistic oppositions yeah. the way we do today because we we've adopted modernity and we we put those categories of opposition between theology versus this because we're working with oppositional views rather than one that orders things the right way within 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 a proper ser- ontology yeah. and so so I, so i'm, I'm kind of working the other way I, I don't work with those oppositions so reading someone else doesn't scare me because they're not in competition with grace Ooh. because they can't be. right and <laughs> you know that's the whole point of grace and works right is they thought that work somehow we're going to reach up to the wrong plane of being and kind of be able to be coordinated with that was even inconsistent with catholic thought for most of its ages so 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 this is you know we got to really learn learn what's the case but anyway i could go on all day and and i'll and i'll just give one last book recommendation (laughs) give you something more modern um tom wolf wrote a book called the painted word about the way Mm. um art was undone by modernity and I think if we're if we're going to be of any use, we need to rediscover and become people that produce art again, 
and art has art was undone. Yeah. Um, you, you've got the the wonderful art of the Middle Ages, the wonderful art of the Reformation, the, um, and even just the art that the that continued on into the Enlightenment that was the fruit, the continued fruit of the uh, of Christianity. We lost that because of the Enlightenment. Tom Wolfe puts his finger on the 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 error that m- produced modern art in a book called The Painted Word. And we need to become people that produce art, poetry, music, movies, all of that again. Um, or we will just continue to s- get people saved and then lose the next generation, get people saved, lose the next generation. So The Painted Word by Tom Wolfe is my last recommendation. Okay. Mm. I, I don't have enough money for all these books. Neither do I. But I'm going <laughs> to... Maybe Kindle. Wait, I was I was mentioning this to you, David, the last time is like I've given a 20 year reading list over the course of a, a year and people are like, yes, I can't man. keep up. It was like, well, yeah, just give give it 20. Years. I don't have I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have 20 years. That's why I'm doing this. I, yeah. I got to get the cliff notes. Right. Right. That's so. what we're trying to do. Cliff notes. This is the cliff yeah. notes. 